Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. News and views with an Asian and Asian American point of view. On tonight's monthly South Asian edition, we spotlight Dalit History Month that is April in addition to also being Poetry Month. Find out how caste and casteism remains a deeply entrenched reality of not just South Asian societies and culture, but also is a disturbing reality of the South Asian diaspora. Today, April 14th, is the 125th birth anniversary of the greatest leader of not just the Dalit rights movement, but indeed, probably from India, Bala Saheb Ambedkar. Later in the show, find out how it is at the intersections of caste, gender and sexuality that the next wave of social justice organizing can be truly cutting edge. I'm your host tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Keep it locked right here on Apex Express. Born into a Dalit family in Western India on April 14, 1891, Bhim Rao Ramji Ambedkar was, as a boy, often humiliated by his high caste schoolmates. Awarded a scholarship by the then ruler of the city of Baroda, now Vadodara, in India, he studied at prestigious universities in the United States, the UK, and Germany. Ambedkar entered the Baroda public service but was once again ill treated by his high caste co workers. He turned to legal practice and teaching and soon established his leadership among Dalit communities, founded several journals and publications and succeeded in obtaining special representation for them in the legislative councils of the Indian government. Contesting Mahatma Gandhi's claim to speak for Dalits or Harijans as Gandhi called them, he wrote, he wrote the book What Congress and Gandhi Have Done to the Untouchables in 1945, a seminal work. Ambedkar was a man of many parts, a scholar, a social reformer, a politician, a religious thinker, and the moving spirit of the Indian constitution. He wrote prolifically over his nearly four decades in public life. Annihilation of Caste is a published transcript of his undelivered speech written in 1936. The speech was prepared as a presidential address for an annual conference of a Hindu reformist group on the ill effects of caste in Hindu society. And after his invitation to speak at this conference, he were, his invitation was withdrawn due to the address's, quote, unbearable content. But Ambedkar was relentless and self-published 1,500 copies of the speech in May 1936. And today, this transcript is one of the best known and widely read critiques of the deeply entrenched nature of caste and untouchability in India. In 1947, Ambedkar became the law minister of the government of Free India and he took a leading part in the framing of the Indian constitution, outlawing discrimination against untouchables and skillfully helped to steer it through the assembly. But he resigned in 1951, disappointed at his lack of influence in an upper caste dominated Indian government. In October 1956, he renounced Hinduism and became a Buddhist together with about 20. 200,000 fellow Dalits at a ceremony in Nagpur in his home state of Maharashtra. Ambedkar's life is truly fascinating and there's many, many archives online that uh, I encourage our listeners to go read up and find out more. And without much ado, I want to bring in our first guest uh, on tonight's uh, Dalit History Month Spotlight to shed some light on the importance of knowing Ambedkar on Dalit History Month and... um, generally how we can be allies both with, from within the South Asian diaspora and, and beyond. Uh, here with us is activist uh, Benjamin Kaila. Benjamin uh, is from Andhra Pradesh in South India. And uh, Benjamin, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you for joining us at short notice. Thank you very much. I'll read a quick bio before we dive into the questions. Benjamin Kaila is from Andhra Pradesh in South India. He tasted caste discrimination from as early as the age of nine when he accidentally touched a school inspector of his father's school. And that earned him merciless caning in front of his own parents. 
Later in life, though not absent, he didn't face incessant discrimination like his peers that and could that continue to this day. And um and uh, reading and finding out about discovering Ambedkar was uh uh in the bio that he shared with me was one of his life changing um changed his life and he's here to tell us about how he has integrated his activism here uh living in the bay area and reading up and finding out about african american history about the holocaust about the apartheid and to really uh integrate all the historical aspects of various in, you know injustice across the world into now in his anti caste organizing and in 2003 he started a non-profit called friends for education international that works with marginalized students in india and uh, empowers them to uh, complete their education so uh, many things to talk about benjamin thank you so much for joining us and thank you for thank your you. very illustrious bio thank you very much uh, preeti and uh, thank you the uh, radio station kpfk Great. for inviting me to this discussion thank you very much yeah so tell us about how you got involved um you sh- i you know when the bio that i read through uh, quickly talks about it but tell us about how you have gotten involved here in the bay area in 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 what's going on in in and tell us also about what's going on in the realm of dalit rights organizing exactly thank you very much yes priti this is uh, benjamin and as you said you have already given a um, very good bio of uh, me and dr ambedkar uh, as you said dr ambedkar was a great man but unfortunately i born in a dalit christian family therefore i never know about dr ambedkar my ideal uh, idol was uh, gandhi like my father my father was a gandhi and staunch gandhi and therefore i was all i, I was not uh, aware of a dr ambedkar till i was 26 years of old, my age that time i was happen and to i was some somebody gave me a biography of dr ambedkar and that opened my eyes and then i started um, reading more and more books try to understand the society why there is a discrimination and how it uh, manifests in india and before that what we would think you know we all uh, think about karma we were all said you know because of some past life you are suffering here and that was the idea we also even though we are christians we were also following the same thing and we never questioned when we were discriminated but dr ambedkar reading of dr ambedkar opened my eyes this is all just to subjugate the people and therefore this is not correct therefore you have to understand to understand is you have to equip with knowledge mm-hmm. knowledge comes from the books therefore i have and for, frankly speaking i came from a very small village and all my education was in telugu medium therefore english was very difficult for me in those days there dr ambedkar i can sell you to dr ambedkar for everything uh, i have done in my with my life therefore in order to improve my english i had to sit with a dictionary and a book english book that's how i learned my english that's great wanting to read about ambedkar yeah <laughs> that's how on this i part. learned ambedkar um, and through ambedkar i came to know several issues several great people like mahatma phule sahu maharaj my priya ram swami all these people and i started reading the biographies i am very much interested in uh, biographies and autobiographies how a person evolved Absolutely. i started reading and i started reading the caste discrimination whatever the book available that's how i came to know about the actual um, manifestations of society in india and oh. then uh, i happened to know bsp bhujan samaj party and kanshi ram i met him twice in hyderabad you have to tell our listeners what that is what is the, what bhujan is the bsp bhujan samaj party was a party in uttar pradesh that uh, brought a dalit woman to power she was she became a um it means of a population uh, most populous uh, country in, in india uttar right. pradesh and uh, the person behind was uh, kanshiram late kanshiram benjamin kanshiram. i want to interject uh, and uh, you yes. know for our listeners you know in the west, especially here in the west people only always talk about gandhi and nehru as le- great leaders from india and uh, so few people also actually know about ambedkar um so tell us about you know uh, if you can tell us about you know i, I st- 
I read a little bit of his vast bio that I could find and um, tell us about why how Ambedkar is significant and also how Dalit History Month came about so that we can know about the enormous and rich history of uh, lineage of you know, Dalit rights activists over the years but very few of us know uh, enough to talk about like all these leaders also you talk about uh, like Foley exactly. and Periyar so tell us a little exactly. bit about yeah Exactly, that is the reason. Uh, Dalit History Month is one of the greatest things that happened uh, to Dalits. It started in 2014, and April is designated as the Dalit History Month. It is inspired by Black History Month, uh, which we celebrate in February. And Dalit, Dalit History Month is very important because more, most of the people, the names I am, I am speaking right now, fully. Um, Mahatma Pule, Sahu Maharaj, Dr. Ambedkar, many people doesn't know. All we know about Ga- India means Gandhi, Buddha, meditation, yoga, all these things. But there is another side of India also. That is Dalit and Dalit discrimination and the people fought for them. Against the society, against these great leaders like Gandhi and all these people. Therefore, Dalit History Month, in this Dalit History Month, we are trying to bring those all, all those names to um, to the mainstream. Mainstream in the sense, as you know, Dalits have no history because they never allowed to read. It is not voluntarily they denied to read, uh, but they were not allowed to read. Therefore, they could not write history. Whatever the history we had was only oral history. That is also dying. But there is a, a beautiful uh, saying in Africa, African saying, it is says, it says, until lion learns how to write, every story will glorify hunter. That's what happened to Dalits as well. Yes. Therefore, we could not write. We could not uh, have any uh, way to express ourselves. And we could not even uh, read anything. In that case, somebody else wrote our history. But we try to reverse it. That's not the way. We will write our own history. We will bring our people who are not known to the world. As I told you, uh, even at, at 26 also, I did not know about all these names. Uh, being a Dalit myself, I don't know about these guys. Because no school textbook told about these guys. We all know Tilak, Gandhi, Nehru, uh, Patel, all these people. But Ambedkar, Phule, um, Sahu Maharaj, we never l- learn about them. Absolutely. Therefore, this is the way we try to. Now, the problem. <clears throat> now, because thanks to Dr. Ambedkar, there are so many intellectuals who came up from this community, the community. They are all writing the books. They are all reading. They are all becoming scholars. And moreover, internet is one thing we are trying to use the, the way we can, like Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, yeah, all these things. We are trying to write our own history. Absolutely. I want to really yeah. congratulate like uh, Dalit tech activists like Tain Mori Sandarajan and a whole bunch of yeah. people who have uh, exactly. created a powerful digital project uh, the, the uh, on Dalit History Month yeah. and uh, has really begun to really shed a light and challenge the very mainstream, mainstream, upper caste narratives, uh, you know, that dominate uh, public memory and spaces in India and in the diaspora. And, you know, right. coming back to the diaspora, which is, you know, I've oftentimes talked about on our show, has been notoriously very upper caste dominated and deeply casteist. And a small contingent of Dalit activists, yourself included, along with upper caste allies, have begun to make visible this ugly beast uh, that is caste reality, entrenched caste discrimination that is pervasive back home and poorly covered by mainstream media, which is again uh, upper caste dominated, right? And, uh, you know, in the past we've had Tain Mori and uh, Asha Kotwal and Christina Danraj on our show who have emphasized how casteism is as pervasive as racism, yet social justice movements in India are only now slowly, intentionally and actively including caste analysis and are beginning to challenge caste-based discrimination. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and how you think in your own, you know, the time that you have done, begun to do activism on Dalit rights, how have you seen this uh, change? Have you seen a change or is there a long way to go? before we even feel that this, we are beginning to make a difference? Exactly. What you said is correct. Because, see, we don't have political power. 
except uh, Mayavati in Uttar Pradesh. We don't have um, media. Nobody uh, care about us. And we don't have um, a judicial system also not uh, favorable to us. In such a situation, uh, this is very difficult for us. Now, uh, as I said, in uh, Bay Area, I came to Bay Area just uh, two and a half years ago. And here I see, well, I have been uh, active in uh, in this field for the last uh, 17 years. I have been in the United States. But in Bay Area, area I see people are coming forward. Yes, we are your allies. We, we will try to support you. Therefore, one good thing I have seen in Bay Area is that. Therefore, I, what I am trying to do is I am trying to, I know, I know 18%, Dalits are 18% of the Indian population. They cannot alone go and fight uh, the rest of the population. Therefore, we need to have allies. We need to have the progressive people among other castes, other communities. Therefore, my, my goal is, my intention is, not just fighting, you know, only the Dalits, fighting for only Dalits. There are so many good people in every community. We try to, if we can gather them and try to make them understand. The biggest reason for the people, for the non-Dalits to understand our problem, I think, is they don't have proper education in the in the social issues. In Dr. Ambedkar, many people refuse to read even Dr. Ambedkar. And they don't read. How can they understand how our lives, Dalit lives? Therefore, what uh, I'm trying to say, let us have a discussion. Let us talk about it. Let us not you know, uh, say, oh, Dalit is a uh, gas system, is a thing of past. No more is there. But that is not the case. Therefore, I am trying to bring uh, whoever is with us. Come and let us discuss. I don't want you to just forget all other leaders and talk about Dr. Ambedkar. Yes, you can read. You have to talk Gandhi. You have to read Nehru. You have to read Patel. Everybody. And what I say is you also read about Ambedkar and compare them. Let them battle in your mind. Come out. Who, who wins it? Mm-hmm. You, the pattern. And because we believe, not only believing, yeah, then Ambedkar had... Uh, he's, he's one of, uh, he was one of the tallest leaders uh, of all time, either in India or in, even in America, in, in, in the world also we can say that. Such a person, how can you ignore? If you ignore him, how can you understand what is happening? What are the real problems of these people, these people who deprived basic human rights for the last 5,000 years? Therefore, this is the way I am traveling. I don't know how much I am successful. There are a lot of people, as you mentioned. Tenmoyi is doing a wonderful job. Asha is doing a wonderful job. They all came here last year. They have, we had a lot of uh, seminars, uh, meetings. You know, all these things happen. Uh, this is how we try to encourage non-Dalits in the diaspora to understand our problems. Because... Here, in, uh, if you see in uh, civil rights movements, there are a lot of white people who fought along with uh, black people. Therefore, we need to work uh, in the, such a way and to improve the condition of Dalits. Improving the condition of Dalits is nothing but improving the condition of India itself. Absolutely. India is going to become a, uh, trying to become a world power. In order to world power, you need to see that these things are not uh, not there in India as well. Absolutely. And you know, um, Benjamin, we began this year also highlighting uh, on our show what happened in India with uh, the young Dalit scholar Rohit Vemula's suicide that was, uh, you know, uh, happened the context of a very right-wing Hindu government in place that is, um, you know, um, exacerbating these, these divisions instead of... Um, improving them or, you know, working towards doing away with caste-based discrimination. So, do you think uh, the, the this current government is actually uh, enabling um, the movement to grow stronger in, uh, as things become worse with the, with the, you know, growing might of the Hindutva forces? Um, or do you think it's actually more challenging um, with this current government in place? Okay, one thing I can uh, tell for you, I am not blaming any government. It is, a, uh, to me, to me, it is a social issue. 
because Rohit Mamla is happened now during BJP time. But before Rohit Mamla, there are twenty people died before in the same circumstances. Absolutely, yeah. Because mm-hmm. of because of um, because of a discrimination. Mm-hmm. These all the scholars, nobody talked about it because, as I already told, no media is uh, willing to cover. In a very uh, maybe five percent of the cases come into light. Therefore, the, the the problem to me, as I see it, it is not Congress, BJP, Telugu Desam, or Communist Party. No, in every state, wherever these people are uh, ruling, these are happening. Whatever the party, whatever the ideology. Therefore, to me, the bigger issue is the social social uh, change. the mindset mindset of uh, the ruling classes and the mindset of the influential caste i don't call even upper caste upper caste lower caste if you call them uh, that is, i don't agree with that mm-hmm. influencer is yeah, reinforcing paradigms caste and okay. uh, therefore these people these caste unless they change their mind yes what we are doing is wrong what we have been doing so far thousands of years is wrong and unless that is not there any government if uh, bjp goes some other government comes the same thing happens uh, therefore i don't pinpoint one government for the problems now i want the social change change the people mindset should be changed that's what i'm thinking yes as you said it is intensifying because this uh, bjp government as you know we are all know how it is acting in every issue um, therefore obviously uh, dalits are getting agitated more now mm-hmm. i don't know what other what will happen now after that but it is int- intensifying we have to wait and see what is going to happen great um, we do have to wrap up soon uh, benjamin ji so is there any closing thoughts as we wrap up on this um, Dear. That's all. Thank, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to um, um, speak uh, in front of you. Yeah, okay. and do you have any Dalit uh, right resources that you can point to online for our listeners? Uh, yes, there's plenty uh, there online. Are, yes. I know. I suggest, I just suggest to those who doesn't know all these issues, please Google, Google Dalit Ambedkar Untouchables. Anything you you get it, and there are so much available so material is available on Dr. Ambedkar, and there are a lot of movies you can see Dr. Ambedkar. There is a feature length movie, the three hours movie. Absolutely, I, I stumbled on it when I was looking for music for tonight's show. <laughs> so yeah. I am looking forward to watching it, and I didn't know about exact, it. Exactly, so. there is a movie, and there is a another document. A lot of documentaries are there. like uh, india untouched one of the best movies you can see and uh, to understand how caste is still persisting even today in india absolutely uh, there are uh, so many materials ambedkar.org ambedkar uh, this is dalithistory.com uh, yes dalithistory.com is to uh, get all this uh, history about the dalits Yeah, and Ambedkar archives. Oh, right. Thank you so much for pointing yeah. that out. Yeah, that was a great. A lot of, just Google and you get it. Yeah. Very easy, simple. These days, learning something is very, very, very easy and fast. Google it, and you can get a thousands of links. Thank you so and much, Benjamin Ji. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, hope to thank have you back uh, next week. We're going to highlight the textbooks campaign with Tain Marie, so it'll be great to have uh, this time. Thank you. So thanks for thank, this opportunity. Sure, thank you and uh, thank you. Uh, Bye bye. So that was uh, Benjamin Kaila from San Jose, long-time Dalit rights activist, here on our show with us to shine a light on the brilliance and importance of Dalit History Month that is April on this occasion of the of the 125th birth anniversary of the legendary leader and visionary Bala Saheb Ambedkar. Up next, a short music break. <laughs> So that was a music clip from this film on Ambedkar that you can just find out by googling on YouTube and you can watch the film it's almost 3 hours long but um seems to be a fantastic film that I can't wait to catch uh myself so ask any south asian to name a political figure and it is bound to be an upper caste person 
ask them to name a dalit intellectual or a political icon most likely they will turn up a blank or at the most the name of the legendary b r ambedkar dalit history month observed through this month of april seeks to address this lack of awareness of dalits in mainstream history and public memory however it is about more than just finding recognition in these narratives the idea of a dalit history month stems from black history month observed the world over Taking off from this, a website called Dalit Nation created the Dalit History Month project following discussions at the Dalit Women Self Respect March organized in 2014 and that we've also covered extensively on Apex Express. This inspiring participatory history project has a digital timeline of Dalit narratives of icons and events that stretch all the way from prehistory to present day. In celebration of Dalit History Month, our next segment uh, is an interview that we taped earlier today with a special guest on air from LA, Sumit Baud. Sumit is a research fellow of, uh, at the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at the Columbia Law School and is a fellow of the Transnational Law Institute at the King's College London. Sumit has advocated for social justice causes and has worked extensively with the Voices Against 377 in India to fight against structural inequalities in the criminal justice system in India. Currently Sumit is completing a JD in law from UCLA and we sat down with him uh, um, that is me and my co-host Arpita Kodaveri uh, an environmental lawyer and activist here in Berkeley uh, we sat down with Sumit and uh, chatted with him about his work and about what this intersectionality of caste gender and sexuality looks like listen up hi sumit so could you tell us a bit about yourself and what really kind of drew you into this area of research of the intersectionality between uh, caste gender and sexuality So while I while I have been working on issues of human rights for more than a decade for me a decisive moment took place in the year 2004 uh, at the time of World Social Forum in India and I don't know how many of our listeners know about uh, the World Social Forum that it brings together social movements from across the world and it moves from one location to the other in 2004 it happened to be in mumbai in bombay and i happened to be invited by a an emerging dalit rights initiative at the time which has since then gone on to become a leading dalit rights initiative i was invited by them and i went to the world social forum um to my uh, delight and discomfort i found that there was also a queer lgbt queer contingent that was organizing a pride march now i say that i was delighted because these were a bunch of my friends who were organizing this and i was delighted that there was going to be a pride march i was not so comfortable or i should say i was anxious because of who had invited me to this forum it was a dalit group and in my own sense in my own assessment i thought that this dalit group would deeply disapprove of my participation in the pride so i was feeling conflicted i wasn't sure if i should go to this pride march or not yet i set aside that anxiety and i went to the pride march but i did something as because i was so conscious i hid my face with a little pride flag now i knew that you know it was no effective strategy of actually hiding my face but it was that fear that i felt within that dalit groups would disapprove that compelled me to do this ridiculous thing as to be in a pride march and at the same time to not feel so proud and to hide my face i could well have not gone to the pride march i did and because i did i brought along the anxiety of being dalit and being queer and that anxiety created a lot of conflict so this moment for me is decisive that steered my interest and attention towards researching this in greater depth because in that moment i realized the mutually exclusive constitution of the two groups and by that i mean that the lgbt queer groups appeared to be what are called upper caste dominant caste persons and there weren't any openly out dalit persons in those groups at the same time there weren't any openly out lgbt queer persons in dalit groups so they seemed like they were mutually exclusive and therefore 
I could only be part of one and not the other. And that anxiety led me to feel and do what I did. And I have since kept that moment as an important point of reference even now because that moment is a defining moment for me. Wonderful. Um, I was wondering if um, one of the things I run into here as myself as an upper caste or Savarna woman as as the term we use to t- to refer to upper caste folks run into every time i try to bring up caste in a lot of the privileged spaces i'm in is that oh but class is as important or more important than caste and uh, especially by the very privileged caste and class of the south asian diaspora here and even back home so can you speak to how caste and class are not interchangeable how there is a desire or a tendency to often conflate the two and so can you help us understand how they are not the same and how oftentimes that's a very counterproductive conflation? Right. So uh, this question you've asked is a really, really important one. And as important as it is, it's not an easy one. So for the longest time, there has been a contention about uh, uh, caste being a kind of class and therefore anything that applies to a class should also apply to a caste. And especially in a left understanding of, uh, of class, uh, there has been an undermining of uh, what is the significance of caste really. Um, my uh, intervention uh, on uh, on a legal understanding takes me to this uh, landmark judgment of the Supreme Court of India in 1991 in the case of Indra Sani, in which an extraordinary bench of, uh, of nine judges, now I'm calling it extraordinary because uh, as we know ordinarily, uh, Supreme Court judges sit in pairs, so they would hear a case Two of them would hear a case together. In extraordinary cases, five of them, you know, what is called a constitutional bench, and even greater, even more extraordinary cases, uh, the case of Indra Sani uh, uh, brought together a a bench of nine judges. Now, this extraordinary bench underwent a number of, or decided on a number of issues, one of which was whether caste is class. And they said, yes, caste is class. Now, that caste being class does not help us in understanding the distinction and which to my understanding is what you're asking you know what is the difference between caste and class and that difference this judgment does not tell us on the contrary it actually conflates the two so this conflation is remains ambiguous and it does not understand the specificities of subordination that people experience because of caste for example untouchability now untouchability is something that has remained across generations across hundreds of years and it is still alive and well especially so in rural areas where there are localities that are segregated on caste lines and although there might be and there is disadvantage because of class that is that a disadvantage is more specific and is different and is peculiar when it comes to caste so while every caste is class there needs to be an understanding about how the caste operates how the caste system operates and especially in relation to untouchabilities and untouchables because there are those specificities which tell us something specific something peculiar about what is going on with caste So, um, coming back to untouchability, um, I realized that um, here in the West, there is a very exotic understanding of untouchability, but it's actually very pervasive and very real. And that too, one where um, we get to hear very little about in the mainstream media in India, which is also, again, largely upper caste dominated. So, I was wondering if you could... um, talk about that a little bit and how pervasive that is and how if some of the mobilizing that we're seeing is able to at least challenge it somewhat has there been a shift in at least challenging untouchability here i would first say that i am not so much a part of the south asian diaspora as you know i'm only just visiting us for the purposes of my research and i've only just been here a little over two years and in that the limited uh, exposure that i have had to the diaspora uh, i would say that one there is the commonality of surnames and often these surnames are caste oriented whether or not you know there is an explicit understanding that uh, what is the caste of certain groups those caste identities are carried in our surnames so that is one 
on the other hand the obscurity of certain surnames you know when certain surnames are obscure the understanding is that they are uh less well to do or they are disadvantaged in other way or they are dalits or they are you know the, because of the caste surname the upper caste nature of those surnames um there is a conscious or unconscious ways in which people interact with each other those surnames have carried over even with the diaspora so those prejudices have remained so that is one the other i would say the other thing that i might say about the diaspora is the is the practice of arranged marriages mm-hmm. and we know that arranged marriages are uh, often done on caste lines so these are the two i would say at least two big ways the surnames and arranged marriages in which caste seems to have made this transnational move in which it has gone on from south asia and entered uh, united states and here with the south asian diaspora and it is pervasive in the ways in which south asian diaspora is constituted it's uh, it's composed and it plays out in our day to day life without we being conscious of it at all times Absolutely I think there are many many subtle and not so subtle ways that casteism gets just reinforced that uh, the savarna folks don't want to talk about so Sumit you had earlier sort of alluded to these mutually exclusive movements which is the queer movement and the anti caste or the dalit rights movement and so my question now like which I found kind of interesting about your research was to explore what according to you are the barriers within the queer movement that didn't really allow for the realization of the inter- uh, intersectionality about of being dalit and being queer right so i think the first barrier i might say is a very conflation of caste and class that we talked about this conflation of caste and class was such that there was an existing understanding of what are called working class and it was understood that the working classes experience gender and sexuality differently but there was no understanding of who constituted this working class so if there had been that inquiry that interrogation there would have been an understanding that a majority of dalits adivasi folks constitute this working class now it might be that for the sake of understanding how genders and sexualities are experienced it doesn't matter whether it is caste or class but here is how the lgbt queer movement had major constraints in addressing some of the arguments and issues that were core to for example the decriminalization campaign the decriminalization campaign as we as we know focused on the decriminalization in private now this is interesting because while these arguments were being made there was also an understanding that a lot of sex occurred in spaces that were not private what were these not private spaces so to say it as they were this was sex outdoors the sex outdoors was somehow something that caused so much panic so much anxiety that it was never brought into legal formulations into demands for law reform and what happened there was a careful and conscious hiding of something that was known to everybody that was known to many advocates that was known to many activists and often there was an component a, an element of thrill associated with sex outdoors now it might well be that some people experience thrill of sex outdoors and this is not to undermine expression of that sexuality but at the same time there needs to be an understanding of the compelling circumstances the compelling circumstances that compel some people to experience sex outdoors for example the compelling circumstances of homelessness for example the compelling circumstances of sexual violence homelessness and sexual violence are never matters of choice or preference these are something that people undergo because of disadvantage because of marginalization and who might be some of these people who undergo these experiences these are people who are devoid of privilege these are people who undergo oppression who undergo discrimination who are, who face extreme circumstances of violence 
And these are the people whose realities were being deliberately set aside and the demands for law reform were somehow being sanitized and cleansed and presented to the court in a manner that was far from reality. And what that yielded was, in 2009, as we know, the Delhi High Court decriminalized uh, uh, or uh, read down Section 377. Uh, but that reading down was in private and it continued to criminalize and place vulnerability upon those sections of population who had previously and continued to experience sex outdoors. So it did nothing to reduce their vulnerability. And that is something that was and remains a fraught issue within LGBTQ mobilizing. And also, um, Sumit, what then are the barriers within the Dalit rights movement that does not adequately or is unable to um, grapple with issues around sexuality? That's a tricky question. And it's a tricky question because it will put me in trouble with Dalit movement if I answer that, in all honesty. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that, uh, um, that it's a... Uh, that, that, is, that there haven't been sufficient uh, interventions within the Dalit movement that would uh, inform us in any way to be able to answer that question in all fairness. The part that I say that it is tricky and it would place me in difficulty with the Dalit movement is, of course, said tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> uh, but the fact is also that there have been uh, very few or no interventions that would really elicit a fair response to your question. I can make two speculations, and my first speculation would be this, that uh, there, the, 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 the constitution or the composition of LGBT queer groups is such that it is mostly so-called upper caste, dominant caste, suburban folk, and that constitution, that composition, somehow creates an environment of hostility, again, consciously or unconsciously, it creates an environment that doesn't say you are welcome to Dalit folk, or it creates, again, in conscious and unconscious ways, uh, you know, uh, often what is banter. So the kind of humor that is often delivered is, will attack or will bring to shame some of the caste backgrounds of some people to whom they might be sensitive, but it will be completely unknown to those who deliver that banter. So I think that is very important to look out for uh, and to understand how certain social groups and movements can be knowingly and unknowingly hostile and unwelcoming of the other. That is one part. The other part of the queer movement would be a unstated a common perception that perhaps the Dalit movement is neither sophisticated enough nor educated to understand the nuances of sexuality. And I think that is something that is very, very offensive and condescending. And there needs to be a self-interrogation on the part of those LGBTQ mobilizing who might so impute a status of, you know, that there is lesser sophistication and lesser education within Dalit movements. That is, that is the other. Now, I would hazard a guess and likewise speculate on what might be the factors with Dalit movement. And I would say that things like misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, these are all, uh, you know, uh, common prejudices and biases that would prevail and apply as much to any Dalit group as it would to the society at large. So, the kinds of response that the Dalit movements might sometimes give to LGBTQ mobilizing would somehow, somewhere be on these lines. You know, there would be misogyny, there would be transphobia, there would be homophobia. And that doesn't help a mutual understanding of the two groups. So I think both of these groups, the LGBT queer mobilizing and the Dalit rights movements, need to reach out to each other. And to be able to understand each other, there needs to be perhaps people who are both LGBTQ and Dalit who could be conduit, who could facilitate a dialogue, a conversation between the two groups. And I'm just giving that as an example. I'm not saying that is the only strategy. But certainly people who experience their caste and their gender and their sexuality and the marginalizations of all these could be good ambassadors who could facilitate a dialogue between the two groups. Great, and I think with the folks like you who are bringing in that intersectionality intentionally, um, so it's going to only change for the better, right? Like there's so much that has not been done in the past, but moving forward, we're learning from that and that gives you a lot of hope, I'm sure. 
It gives world. me a lot of anxiety, to be honest. Oh, really? Why is it that? It gives me a lot of anxiety <laughs> because I am always thinking, will I be received, respected, accepted into a group? So when I enter a space, I enter that space carefully and I time and pace myself in a way that facilitates the conversation rather than uh, throw the conversation out. So as much as I say that people who are both queer and Dalit might be able to facilitate, I think it also places a lot of responsibility on us mm -hmm. to do that task. And this is not something that I am saying of my own experience. We have found that often with women's movement, for example, there is a understanding that Dalit women will bring attention to the intersection of caste and gender. Now, it is not the responsibility exclusively of Dalit women to do that. It is everybody's responsibility. And if we are failing in that responsibility, although people who are located at those intersections might be conduits or ambassadors of facilitating that conversation, but there has to be an understanding that that places an, a lot of anxiety upon them because they are doubly exposed and I can certainly say of my own experience, it does that. So I look to this space with hope and aspiration, but I'm also telling you something that I undergo. Uh, and I, you know, I would be, I would be hiding that if I was to say that, yes, there is only hope and aspiration here. There is also a lot of anxiety. But I would continue this on the line that you suggested that there is hope and aspiration. Yes, there is hope and aspiration there. But there are at least two other factors that we need to look out for that only because there is an emerging visibility of people like me will not mean, A, that the social movements will be immediately recognizing, you know, will, acc will accord that recognition to the people and to the issues. That is one. The hindrance, the limitations that have prevailed in the past will continue to prevail, and people like me and everybody will have to push against them together. The other part, because I focus on the law, I find that there is something about the law which necessitates or compels people to live their lives in these single axes. For example, there would be an understanding of what is a man, what is a woman, or what is transgender, and what is scheduled caste, what is scheduled tribe. These are all legal legal formulations and these legal formulations again consciously and unconsciously play upon us and we live the script similarly when social movements engage with the law for example place demands for law reform they are forced to comply within existing legal categories so the law will not just accept any demand for law reform it will say if you want to come to me come to me in this form so that form, that formality, will often keep the existing single axes in which we live our lives, and those single axes will not be facilitative for an intersectional dialogue, conversation, debate, discourse. So despite the hope and aspiration that people like, my, my, like me might signal to our respective movements, I think both our respective movements and the law need to know that there is something much more about this that we need to understand and do something about. So, in the same spirit of hope and aspiration, at the same time the constraining impact of the law, um, what do you think uh, the role of law really is in, in terms of shaping the discourse around uh, the intersectionality between caste, gender and sexuality? Right, so I think one, I sort of, uh, you know, uh, was steering in that direction. Uh, the law creates these categories, so uh, um, these categories um, exist, and then we live our lives in those categories, knowingly and unknowingly. Many of us uh, reject those categories and live our lives differently, and then we come in conflict with the laws. Um, so um, there is, uh, there is uh, that subjectivity of the law, that uh, remains to, that continues to influence us. And likewise, that very subjectivity of the law needs to be changed and uh, understood for the better. And I think, uh, again, with the experience of Dalit rights movement uh, in India, there could be a better understanding of the law. I say that because, you know, despite a plethora of uh, anti-caste legislations in India, we know that the situation has uh, 
uh, is no better. You know, there is a pervasive uh, uh, infliction of violence against Dalits. Uh, there are uh, there is pervasive discrimination. So. The question to ask is that where is the hope and aspiration of anti-caste legislations that uh, seemingly uh, remedied uh, caste uh, oppression, caste-based oppression of across centuries, across generations, but apparently not. And I think any movement that continues to look to law as a tool of liberation must understand that tool that law is both a tool of liberation and subordination. So. To understand law in a single dimension will yield an insufficient understanding of the law. So for these movements to come together and to understand from each other's experience, and particularly I'm saying the Dalit rights movement, it provides that opportunity to engage more critically with law as a tool of subordination and a tool of liberation empowerment. With that understanding, we can move towards a more transformative legal agenda which will allow us to learn from experiences of the past and to understand law in such a way that would facilitate transformative changes within, structural changes within the law. Wow, Sumit, as you speak, I was reminded of uh, last year, I think, so Sandeep Roy, uh, who's a queer writer himself, talks about how uh, in, in the context of India and probably everywhere that culture or law follows culture and the culture is kind of like toothpaste out of the tube and so you know with the 377 movement at some level the, the, the awareness of these rights and the visibility is kind of it's kind of like that toothpaste out it can't go back in it can only go forward so in that sense uh, law can be strategically used to follow the cultural changes that are taking place uh, with uh, more visibility around these issues issues and um, you know also greater solidarity with um, LGBT movements abroad to and then also make this movement the complex the way it needs to be being intersectional which it has not um, so we can go on talking but we do need to wrap up and um, I was wondering if you had any closing thoughts um, as you are talking about these intersectionalities that have not been historically brought up Yes, so I was going to say the closing thought that I have is again on uh, marking the 125th birth anniversary of Baba Sahab uh, Ambedkar and I'm so honored and delighted that uh, uh, it is on this day that uh, we have uh, had this conversation. Absolutely. And uh, with that I will also say the progressive vision of Baba Sahab Ambedkar uh, from a time that many of our generation may not relate with personally and yet the progressive vision of this man was such that it continues to be relevant today. But the tragedy of that relevance is that little has been done to actually accomplish real change. So I think that as you and I speak and through the medium of, uh, of this radio program, as we are reaching out to more people, I really hope that the message that is central to the written works, uh, the, the works of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, could be brought forth and there could be a contemporary understanding, an application of that understanding to making more structural changes into our lives, into our societies, into the system so that we could move towards a society that is more humane, compassionate and just. Absolutely. Jai Beam on that note. <laughs> Jai Beam, uh, Preeti, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank uh, you so much, Sumit. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So that was an interview uh, Arpita Kodavari and I had earlier today with uh, Dalit rights activist and lawyer uh, Sumit Baud. Sumit was a, is a research fellow at the Center for Intersectional, Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at the Columbia Law School and a fellow of Transnational Law Institute at the King's College in London and is currently completing a JD in law from UCLA talking to us about the very vibrant and very um, historically unresearched uh, intersections of caste, gender and sexuality uh, from the uh, looking at it in India, uh, the social justice movements in India. So that brings us to an end of end uh, for tonight's show, but I do have a couple of quick calendar updates uh, from our community calendar. Um, on Monday, April 18th at 7pm um, the Impact Hub in Oakland is hosting 
uh, in collaboration with Asians for Black Lives and the Oakland Anti-Police Terror Project, a creative arts practice workshop addressing police mus- misconduct, state-sanctioned violence, and its celebration of Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name. So, uh, check out this event where stories of freedom and struggle will be shared while learning processes and techniques in comic making where you can create your own comic page. There's also a panel discussion fe- featuring a number of activists. Uh, you can find out more by googling Impact Hub, uh, which is at 2323 Broadway in Oakland. And this is on Monday, April 18th at 7. Um, the College of San Mateo is hosting the 7th Annual Asian Pacific American Film Festival that starts on April 29th and goes on till the 30th. A two-day festival featuring about four films. And uh, you can find out more by joining their Facebook page at CSMAPAFF. That is an acronym for the College of San Mateo's annual Asian Pacific American Film Festival. Um, That brings us to an end of tonight's show. I've been your host and producer tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. And Apex Express um, is produced weekly on Thursday evenings by a collective of uh, folks including Marie Che, Ellen Che, Tara Darabji, Salima Hamirani, uh, Preeti Mangla Shekhar um, and Michael Yoshida uh, and Robin Takiyama. Uh, please subscribe to our podcast, uh, join our Facebook page, that's Apex Express, listen to our archives and give us feedback, show suggestions, guest suggestions and if you're an Asian or Asian American and if you want to intern with us, Write to us at apex at kpfa.org. Next week, we will continue our Spotlight of Dalit History Month, where we will be focusing on a local campaign called the California Textbooks Campaign that surfaces how uh, Dalit Dalit rights activists are mobilizing proactively against the Hindu right here in California. And we will also bring you some highlights... um, from local Dalit organizing. Uh, thank you uh, for listening tonight and I've been your host and producer Preeti Mangla Shekhar. And thank you to Rod for being on the board. <laughs>